Okay, as uh, Michelle just talked about, uh, as part of the as part of the Sandy Beach uh, Surf Zone Fishes Project, uh, we focused on red tail surf perch as one of the target species. Uh, as part of that project, we um, conducted a, a feeding study, a dietary analysis of the red tail surf perch, and that is what I am going to talk about today. Can you speak into the microphone? Yeah, sorry. What just happened? Uh, okay, what I'm going to talk about uh, very, very briefly, very, very briefly today, uh, I'm going to talk about the fish collection methods and the laboratory methods we use to work them up. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little of the data analysis. We did some of the more simple data analysis and the results of those particular analyses. And then at the end, I want to spend a couple minutes talking about uh, selected prey items uh, because I think that they are important in allowing us to actually see how these fish are interacting with the surf zone habitat. Uh, the fish were collected in 2014 and 15, and for the dietary analysis, all of the samples from both years were pooled. They were collected from four reference sites from Kellogg up here in the north, Gold Bluffs, Mad River, and then 10 Mile down here in the, in the south. Uh, our goal was to collect an average of 12 fish per site per collecting trip. Uh, we ended up with a total of 261 fish, and the fish were uh, placed on ice immediately when they were collected, and they were returned to the lab for processing on ice. Uh, in the laboratory, the fish were processed within 24 hours of capture. Uh, when we return uh, whole fish to the lab like this, we like to take as much information from them as we possibly can. So we take a variety of length measurements, we get a total fish weight, we dissect out the intact gut, liver, gonads, other things. We collect odorless samples, uh, we take scale samples and fin clips. and. Uh, a variety of analyses can obviously be done on all these materials and uh, uh, a lot of them are being done by us and by some people from other agencies on these particular fish. However, the thing I'm going to talk about here obviously is the diet analysis. Uh, to begin with, uh, fixed guts were opened and the contents were looked at under a dissecting scope. Uh, the entire gut, this is a surf perch gut, the entire gut was used for the analysis. Uh, for each fish, all of the gut contents were identified to an appropriate taxonomic level. Uh, we counted all the prey. Uh, for each fish, all the prey in one taxon group were grouped and weighed together uh, to the nearest milligram. We ended up with 246 fish with non-empty guts, and that's what the analyses that I'll talk about are based on. Uh, some of the more simple things that we calculated for these fish were abundance. That's the, simply the number of the prey taxon. We calculated percent number, which is just the number of that particular prey taxon uh, divided by the total number of prey items times 100. Uh, similarly, with weight, uh, we took the weight of a prey taxon. Uh, the percent weight was the weight of the particular uh, prey taxon divided by the total weight of prey items uh, times 100. And then the percent frequency of occurrence was the number of guts containing that given taxon uh, over the total number of guts that we looked at. Uh, all, of these, uh, all of these particular simple uh, parameters are biased. They are not in and of themselves an adequate representation of dietary diversity. So we use them to calculate a metric called the index of relative importance, the IRI. And the index of relative importance uh, looks at or takes into account both percent number, percent weight, and percent frequency of occurrence. Uh, notice that all of these metrics are calculated on pool data. And we looked at the data both as one overall data set, and we also looked at site and size specific dietary patterns. Uh, when I talk about the results, I'm going to talk very, very briefly about some of the representative results. I want to mention, uh, oh, I want to, I want to mention, uh, in addition to the overall trends, some site and size-specific trends. Uh, first of all, uh, this table represents 
All of the prey, prey items pooled from all of the sites and they are ranked by abundance. Uh, a couple of things just to take away from this table. Number one, if you look at this prey item column, you go, well, there are a lot of things there. and This is nice. They eat a very diverse diet. Uh, but in fact, if you look, remember these are ranked by abundance, and if you look at the percent number column, you will see that a very few prey items make up most of the diet. Uh, in fact, the two most abundant prey items, fish, eggs, and sand crabs, which someone just asked about, make up together about 75% by number of the total number of prey items that were eaten. Uh, conversely, if you look over here at the percent weight column, you'll see that the sand crabs, which made up about 27% of the diet by number, make up about 68% by weight, and the fish eggs, which made up nearly 50% by number, make up only one half of 1% by weight. And this is just illustrates further that these simple metrics by themselves are not an adequate measure of dietary diversity. So what we did is we used uh, those uh, parameters to calculate the index of relative importance. This is the same pool data that we saw on the previous slide, or this table represents the same pool data. But the uh, items now are uh, ranked by index of relative importance rather than by percent or by abundance. And if you look, the three most important prey items over the whole study uh, were sand crabs, were sand crabs, fish eggs, and shrimp. Uh, if you look at sand crabs, remember they ranked second in abundance, they ranked first in weight. And they also occur, they rank first in frequency of occurrence, they occurred in 75% of the fish stomachs that we looked at. That results in them being ranked first, of course, by index of relative importance. Uh, fish eggs, remember, were the most abundant, but they had a very low weight. They were found in 10% of the stomachs that we looked at. And so they're still the second most important prey item that we found. But in fact, if you look at their index of relative uh, ab importance, it's over an order of magnitude less than the IRI for the sand crabs. So sand crabs measured by uh, IRI are certainly the most important uh, prey species. When you break the data down a little bit more, it looks a little bit more interesting. Uh, this uh, shows the IRI values uh, for each of the four sites separately. Uh, what you can see, number one, is that sand crabs indeed are the most important dietary item. If you look, these green bars represent sand crabs. They're most important a dietary item at all sites. In Mad River, that's practically all the fish ate. Uh, if you look at 10 Mile down in the south, again, sand crabs were the primary item, but in fact, uh, the, the second, the only other really important prey item uh, were amphipods, and I'm going to talk more about that particular point in just a couple of minutes. Uh, if you look at Kellogg and Gold, B Gold Bluffs, what you see, number one, is that the diets are much more uh, diverse, and we attribute that to the fact that the habitats are more heterogeneous. There are more patches of rocky reef interspersed into the sandy intertidal at those sites than at the other sites. Uh, second thing to notice here, in, in addition to the diversity of diet, is that the second most important dietary item at both of those sites were fish eggs. These little olive green bars are fish eggs. Uh, and there, uh, there were no fish eggs at all found in the guts from the fish from the other two sites. OK, uh, we were also interested in looking at the effect of fish size on what they were eating. So we divided the fish into <coughs> three size classes, small, medium, and large, and you can see the sizes down here, less than 170 millimeters, between 170 and 220, and greater than 220. Those look a little different from the lengths that Michelle was reporting when she was talking, because these are standard lengths, not total lengths, and that they were taking total lengths out in the field. If you, uh, when you look at the bars, these numbers above each of the bars represent the number of fish in each of the categories. And if you look at them across these three sites, you can see we have a good distribution of fish both in each size category and across all three of those sites. Uh, if you look at the 10 mile uh, uh, site, however, it's a little bit different. Number one, there are only 22 fish. Uh, there are only two fish in the large fish size class. 
And in addition, and even more importantly, 21 of these 22 fish were caught in a single sampling trip in June of 2015. Uh, that means, and there are only two fish, note there are only two fish in the large fish category. That means that anything we say about the results of this study as far as 10 mile go have to be interpreted very, very carefully. Uh, okay, so if you look at the IRI values for these major uh, tax not prey groups, uh, by size class within each of the sites, uh, again, you see some pretty uh, clear trends. Uh, number one, uh, sand crabs, of course, remain the most uh, uh, important dietary item as judged by IRI across all of the sites and across and in all size classes. If you look at Mad River, once again, for all three of the size classes, the fish are primarily eating sand crabs. Uh, if you look here at 10 Mile, again, the fish are eating sand crabs and they're all eating amphipods and this is kind of unusual these amphipods that i'm talking about are very small gamerids uh, uh, intertidal amphipods and uh, are surf zone amphipods excuse me not intertidal are surf zone amphipods and you would not expect to see almost really the size of fish we're dealing with eating these small amphipods you certainly would not expect to see the medium and large fish eating them uh, for example, to illustrate this, there's one little blue bar over here that represents amphipods and the small uh, uh, mad river fish. That blue bar represents one of the smallest fish that we looked at, a very small fish, of 116 total amphipods in the guts of the mad river fish, 112 of them were in the stomach of that small fish. So you don't expect big fish to be eating amphipods. Uh, in addition, what's kind of interesting here is that one of the big fish, remember in this category, there are only two big fish at, at 10 mile. One of those fish was caught with the small and medium, the 20 small and medium fish here in June of 2015. That fish had a gut full of these small amphipods. Uh, when you look at the second big fish, who was the lone fish that was caught in October of 2015, he wasn't eating amphipods. And so what this tells us, again, is that you need to interpret these results very carefully and it also tells us there must have been a lot of small amphipods on the beach down there at 10 Mile during June of 2015. Uh, the other thing to look at here is that, uh, again, at Kellogg and Gold Bluffs, uh, the more uh, heterogeneous environments, you see more dietary diversity that holds across size classes as well as just for the sites. Uh, one thing to notice here is remember the second most important prey item uh, at those two sites uh, more fish eggs, and if you look, it was the small and medium fish at both sites that were feeding on the fish eggs. Uh, the larger fish were eating things like here, for example, at Kellogg, they were eating things like acorn barnacles, other fish, uh, echinoderm, shrimp, uh, over here primarily other fish. Uh, and so the dietary diversity also held here, uh, but there was certainly a pattern to it. Okay. What I want to finish up with is talking about of the few of the, speci uh, the, sp the specific prey items that we saw. Uh, I want to do this because I think talking about them helps us to understand a little bit how these fish are actually foraging in this high energy uh, surf zone beach habitat. And probably the thing I want you to take away from this section is that these fish are very oppor opportunistic feeders. Uh, first of all, First item, sand crabs. Remember, they were certainly the preferred prey at all sites, among all size classes of fish. And what you expect to see then is you expect to see small fish eating small sand crabs, and you expect to see big fish eating big sand crabs. And we did see that. We saw what you expected. But in addition, we saw at certain times, we saw the medium fish especially, but also a few of the large fish eating large numbers of sometimes very, very small sand crabs. And what it looked like was that the fish were actually just uh, trundling along and they'd see masses of small sand crabs and they just sort of suck them up. They weren't chewing them, they, they break up a lot of their prey items with their pharyngeal teeth. These weren't chewed up, they were just taken in like they were just gulping them in. And to a certain degree it reminds you kind of what we saw at 10 Mile uh, in that there were bigger fish eating lots and lots of small prey, which you really wouldn't normally uh, expect to be the case. Uh, secondly, the second prey item, fish eggs. 
Remember, they were found only, taken by fish only at Kellogg and Gold Bluffs. They were essentially all smelt eggs, and they were eaten only by the small and medium fish. However, the small and the medium-sized classes of fish were eating these prey items, were eating the fish eggs differently. Uh, if you look at guts from medium fish, what you see here is that these guts are full of gravel. They're full of the spawning substrate. And the fish are uh, actually taking in eggs along with the spawning substrate. And if you look closely at uh, these at a higher magnification, you see that there are eggs and little, little nice little smelt embryos mixed in with the spawning substrate. Uh, what this indicates is these fish are not picking these small prey items out of the substrate, but they're just simply, again, inhaling larger, ingesting large amounts of substrate along with the pr small prey items. Uh, if you look at the small fish that are eating fish eggs, in fact, they're not doing that. What they appear to be doing, this is actually from one small fish gut, they appear to be picking out the small prey items individually. There's not much substrate in with them. And for example, this fish was eating lots of little fish eggs and embryos, had a string of invertebrate eggs, some of those very small amphipods that I was talking about, a little smelt embryo, a little sea cucumber. So they're feeding in a totally different way. That's 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, at, uh, uh, in addition, uh, another prey item, almost done here, another prey item was worms. Uh, they weren't nearly as important a category, but what they show is something very similar. Uh, medium and large fish were taking them when they were ingesting these relatively small polychaetes, most of these worms were polychaetes, they were actually ingesting the substrate around them also. Okay? They were sucking in the sand that these worms were found in, very similar to the fish, the larger fish that were feeding on the fish eggs. Uh, the last thing, and this is totally different, I'm just mentioning it, uh, crabs, the prey item crabs, in the entire study, I found one small, about one centimeter crab that had been ingested and crunched up a nice fresh crab by one fish. Everything else in the crab category were actually just fragments of large crab carapaces, legs, things like that. Uh, no other crab remains were found in the fish guts. They were from crabs way too big for these fish to have been eating. And it showed that the fish are actually moving along scavenging on the bottom, just picking up things that they happen to come across. Okay, so in summary from all of this data, what we can say is that sand crabs were clearly the most dominant dietary component for the red-tailed surf perch across size classes and at all four beaches. Uh, the fish prefer sand crabs when they're available, but they're very opportunistic uh, with regard to both the type of prey that they come across and the size of that prey. It's not always what you would expect them to be eating. Fish from the more heterogeneous environments had more diverse diets and they definitely forage on the bottom. They appear to capture prey on the surface and also pick prey, the smaller fish pick prey out of the substrate. Uh, and uh, the larger fish tend to eat fish on the, or eat prey on the surface, but also eat things out of the substrate that they actually just take in with large amounts of substrate. So they, in, by and large, are very opportunistic feeders. Thank you.